Hey everybody out there in internet meme land, it's time to hide your kids and hide your wife because it's time for the SMC Journal podcast. Some of you will get that joke, others will not. I'm Scott Moore, your host. Thank you so much for being with me today. This is the podcast where we talk about software engineering in the enterprise IT space. We talk about testing, tuning, performance, observability, security, AI, and more. Today is a special episode about Kubernetes. Specifically, how do you scale it properly and what's the necessary approach to do that? We're spending a lot of money on these environments for it and it's just getting out of hand. How do we deal with this? Well, in order to answer that question, we need to talk to somebody who is used to solving that problem. And that's why today I'm going to be talking to the co-founder of SpeedScale. We're going to be talking about problems that people are experiencing in scaling Kubernetes in a microservices and containerized environment. So let's talk to Ken. Ken, welcome back to the SMC Journal podcast. It's great to see you again. Yeah, great to see you too, Scott. I think SpeedScale's been on the show maybe three times. This is either the third time or the fourth time. Uh, so you're a regular guest. Uh, but for those who are watching this show for the first time and they don't know who you are and who SpeedScale is, why don't you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Scott, for having us again. Uh, Ken Ahrens, I'm the, one of the co-founders and CEO of SpeedScale. We are a Kubernetes development tool for developers who are building microservice apps and trying to figure out, hey, I'm changing this code. Is this about to blow up before I push it into production? We help them figure that out by creating the production conditions uh, in their staging environments and on their own local development machine. And we do it by capturing the real traffic from an application and letting them replay it, change the scenarios around and things like that. So uh, definitely we don't want to, uh, last thing you want when you're putting some code in and pushing it to prod and go to lunch is, is to get that alert that uh, something's broken. So we want to prevent that as much as possible. Those people who have been doing performance testing and load testing in the past, they're used to creating automated scripts, replaying them through some kind of a mechanism and then and watching this. This is totally different. This is, you're taking like actual traffic and converting it in some way so that you can replay it as if it's real traffic again. And you deal with all of those things like making sure that the dynamic data that's being passed is always different so that we're not caching databases. You've solved those problems, right? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, our approach is, is different. People are very familiar with this space. I can sit down and write a script. I can write a load test and things like that. We want to help developers do that faster. Instead of having to write scripts or write code, we produce the traffic. It looks like a spreadsheet or uh, logs a list of all the different API calls. And obviously you can't just take it from one environment and replay it in another. Uh, hopefully you do some kind of authentication and those authentication tokens expire. We use basically ETL type of data transformations where you can say, transform this data and play it in the new environment. Instead of writing a script, you write a transformation rule, but you don't have to write it over and over. You just do it once. Then you can grab traffic. I've got customers who dip in uh, into production every day and they go grab little slices of traffic and they're always available to the developers and they can say, okay, let me grab that five minutes from this morning, replay it on my machine and ooh, that would be bad if I released it. No one has time to sit down and write scripts for, for a couple of weeks before they do a release. And so we're trying to automate that whole process out. I think it's a really cool approach. It's different. It's, you got to have a, a little bit of a mindset change there, but that, it's, it's very cool. And one of the areas where you guys are really strong and where you're emphasizing your software is in the Kubernetes space, right? You're helping to figure out how to make uh, Kubernetes perform, how to make it scale. And that is something that I think traditional load testing vendors have struggled with. It, it Kubernetes has just taken over the cloud, like it's the operating system of the cloud. And it was so fast, it was like, well... We can still do some of the stuff we used to do with traditional load testing tools and we'll create scripts and we'll, we'll just kind of hit the, the website the way we normally did or the application. Uh, getting into the intricacies of seeing how Kubernetes works, all the components to it and how to make that scale specifically and monitoring it, by the way, and using things like Prometheus. And that. It's been a change. It's been a big, uh, slow change, in my opinion. Tell me about how you uh, are, are able to just hit Kubernetes and see how it scales. Kubernetes enables the teams to build microservice architectures. And the, there's a bunch of advantages that you get. In a traditional uh, kind of application, you would have a monolith 
And testing a monolith is, is a very straightforward. You can do an end-to-end -end test and get a good idea of how this scales and say, okay, I need 20 servers, 100 servers, whatever it is. Well, Kubernetes lets you break the monolith into pieces. And instead of scaling the whole thing, you can scale each piece. So you end up with the ingress where all the traffic comes into your environment. You want to scale that up because everything is, it's the front door, everything's coming in. But uh, you'll have some service that gets a lower amount of traffic and you don't have to give it as many resources. And you, you get a couple of advantages here. You can uh, update just one component without updating the others. And so the way that you release it becomes a lot different and it's very streamlined. So I can make one small code change and then do a quick validation and push it to production. And I get this big efficiency for my ability to, uh, to have a time to market advantage. That's why companies pick technologies like Kubernetes because I can say, make a small change, I can get it into production. Well, the idea of sitting down and running an end-to-end -end test starts to fall apart because I didn't change the end-to-end -end system. I've just updated one microservice here. I've just added one small algorithm. And so what we allow teams to do is to decouple the, uh, these problems and say, I just want to test a service in isolation. Well, uh, it becomes difficult. Let's take an example of a payment API. And I just have that one payment microservice. I don't need to test the rest of the system. Well, payment API probably calls something like a Stripe or a PayPal or a credit card processor. And now in my non-prod environment, I need that set up. I might not have it. So you need to mock that out. A lot of people don't want to take the time to mock out these endpoints because it's labor intensive. So we built an automation that just like how we can automate the inbound calls that look like load tests, we can automate the outbound outgoing calls out of the app and one little container, it's run automatically uh, and it, it's boom, I've got a virtual Stripe, I've got a virtual PayPal, it's sitting in my cluster. Now I can load the thing up. We actually found that was the huge enabling technology. Mm. Once I can mock out these dependencies, I can take my end-to-end -end system and break it into smaller parts. It might be as small as one service. It might be a group. We've called subsystem testing, a group of two or 10 services that work together, and I can load them up uh, as, a, as a group. And that lets teams have a lot more flexibility in figuring out how to discover, is, is my component or my sets of components scaling without having to do a giant end-to-end -end test? Yeah. I know that you have a history, a long history of being involved with service virtualization and mocking. Today, you feel like mocking is even more important now than it was ever before, right? You're totally right. So it used to be there was one key backend system or one key third-party provider uh, that kind of holds up your environment. Well, once you move to microservice architecture, every service has dependencies on other things. And you end up with what some people have coined the microservices monolith, where you actually can't run the app anyway without running every single service. Mm. And so you do need a way to decouple things. And, and like I said earlier, it might not be a single service, but a development team might own four or five services that work together. And what they really want is an ability to run their own stuff without running all the other team services. And of course, uh, dealing with third parties. So the importance of mocking out backends is more important than ever. And so we've actually seen uh, the popularity of mocking tools like Wiremox, probably one of the most popular open source tools that's out there. And uh, of course, SpeedScale for us, it's a key capability that we think um, is ground, you know, is, uh, is, is critical for uh, teams who are trying to test their code. This is something that when people think about, you know, Kubernetes uh, testing it, it's not just for simulating production, it's something that you can actually do in development, in pre-production environments, right? The whole idea is about uh, flexibility. We've seen some themes around things like ephemeral environments, developer environments, preview environments. Um, what, what people are reaching for is they're trying to figure out, I need to get my new code up and running, but uh, again, because of this microservices problem, I can't just run copies of everything. I've got a couple customers who have 200, 300 microservices. And uh, if you set up a preview environment, you're not going to let every developer and every MR uh, create 200 microservices. So uh, we still want to get a, a view of the new code and how it's working. So you need to shrink the environment down. And so a lot of our time, actually, for these kinds of customers is helping them as part of their CI, mock out just the things that are right behind their microservice. I'm working with a hotel company right now. They call it bubble environments. Mm. And as part of their uh, CloudBees, 
uh, automation that build a new container, they put it in a Kubernetes cluster and it immediately install speed scale mocks right behind it. And then they run their existing test automation against it. Here's kind of a, a left field thing. I want to go back to what we were talking about performance testing and load testing Kubernetes itself. So these developers are probably really just concerned with their code, their features, their APIs they're developing, uh, those microservices and the code that's running inside of them. But what about the orchestration pieces of Kubernetes that makes this container orchestration work? When you need to tune and be able to scale each of those pieces that make Kubernetes work, how do you approach that? This is actually a very, a very interesting topic because if you remember back in the Java days, uh, you would spend a lot of time running a test and then setting your uh, Java flags, uh, how much memory to give it, uh, the kind of garbage collection. So Kubernetes has a version of these things. Uh, they're simpler. They don't. There's not as many flags and things like that. But how many replicas should I run? Uh, how much memory and CPU um, and storage should I give to each replica? And uh, Kubernetes gives us an advantage. It's very easy to change these settings and do another run. I recently worked with a customer that, that ran a big load test using SpeedScale. They saw one of their um, really key services, which was about um, like location, store location data. It spun up 100 pods. They, that was actually their limit. They, they didn't want to get more than 100 pods. And he looked at it and said, oh, if we gave each pod a little bit more memory, maybe we won't need as much he gave just a little bit more memory and he could do the same work with 10 pods. Amazing. So you've got to go in and make these settings. And again, it was an end-to-end -end test, but as they went in and looked through their monitoring data, they said, this is sticking out and not working right. So there is a pod autoscaler that's already there. It will decide when it's time to make a new pod, but you as a user have to define how much memory and CPU does this workload need? And you need good load testing to figure that out. And so these two kind of go together. You have the load testing world going with kind of that uh, SRE DevOps world to figure out how do I size the environments. But the advantage is you can really fine tune. Each service can have its own set of uh, how it should scale. It sounds to me like a lot of companies, they, they want to jump into Kubernetes and they don't realize they need to be doing this. And then they end up over provisioning all of this stuff and then they pay a whole lot of money in the cloud because they've done they haven't tuned it and it, it would save them so much money if they just started off by tuning and making it is the most efficient that it could be oh yeah it's it's very easy to kind of get out ahead of it even at speed scale early on we had a cluster uh, for our production environment i'm not kidding scott is 10 times the size of our cluster today and we actually have a lot more customers now because early on, you turn it on, you put a couple workloads in, and then all of a sudden you have a lot of nodes. There are some innovations that I have seen that help you with your node sizing. We're using one called Carpenter with a K, it came out of AWS. It's for uh, AWS EKS clusters specifically. It will help figure out what's normal for your workload and get the uh, correct size of nodes. So uh, it, it usually will put a really big node in there and, f and fit as many pods on as possible. And then uh, when your workloads move around, it will shrink things back as well. So uh, those tools help you with your nodes, which is kind of like how many servers you're running, but you, your applications are running in the pods. You, that's on you. you got to figure out how to size them. A lot of people have been focused on how to tune these in production. You can use your production monitoring data. You know, I used to work at New Relic, and I've and I've used a lot of these tools: New Relic, Datadog, AppDynamics, Dynatrace. They give you a lot of great data to understand how well are you utilizing your infrastructure. And people use that to tune production. Then you go into non-prod, and none of it is tuned. I recently found a study that said 45% of the cloud bill is going to non-prod. I'm working with a customer right now. They do blue-green deployments. They have about 350 microservices, okay? So just one cluster has got 700 microservices running in it. <laughs> I know because uh, we have a GUI that lists the services and, and it, it timed out pulling them all, the early version of our stuff. We had to make it work for such a long list. I, I said, why are you running so many? Well, we have blue-green in production and this is how we have non-prod set up. And then I learned they have two of these clusters because they have the current version of the software and the next version of the software. Well, Scott... What do you think the average CPU utilization is on these environments? Yeah, I'd say very minimal. It's approaching zero, right? Yeah. So we've got four copies of the environment, and then they've got a dedicated environment for performance. So 
This is where service mocking can help a lot because you don't have to make four, five, six, seven copies of the uh, end to end infrastructure for non prod. You can have one good staging environment where you put everything in, but actually work with the developers so that they have what's, what they need on their own machine. For a while, I was a big fan of the desktop-based Kubernetes. If you look on our blog on SpeedScale, I've uh, evaluated, I use Minikube as the one from CNCF, but there are others. MicroKates from Canonical is pretty well known, and there's Kind. There's many of these different tools. What I found was it's too much cognitive load for a developer to say, you're going to be an expert in Java, in CI, CD, in building testing tools, and you're going to know Kubernetes, the cloud infrastructure, and all this stuff. So at SpeedScale, what we've done the past couple months, we'll cut out the whole Kubernetes part. So you can actually mock out all of your dependencies. This code depends on the code from your team, Scott. It depends on a third-party API. It depends on a database. And with one command line tool on your machine, it can mock all those things out and talk to your existing code, your Java, your Golang, your Node.js, whatever. And that's been a huge surprise would chop away at that 45% of the cloud bill. And the developers are actually happier because they don't have to, uh, you know, they don't have to run Minikube and try to understand all the cube CTL commands and all that stuff. So uh, this has been kind of eye-opening for us how innovative it is. Take a look and follow our kind of YouTube as we release some of these capabilities. Our CTO, Matt, just did a recording, five-minute recording on how you run all these on your own machine locally. And we released it this week. So this is a huge area of focus for us right now. Well, I don't know if you can hear that rumble, but I think there's some footsteps that are just running towards the screen. How can I fix this? It seems like Ken has the answer to my problem <laughs> and getting a handle on all these microservices and the money. So how can people find out more about this and get these solutions from you? So uh, obviously we're online, speedscale.com. You can come and read our blogs and take a look at our site, but uh, stay tuned here to see some of our updates as we talk about developers. We're working on a VS Code extension, for example, and say, hey, I got my code, but I want to, um, you know, how about all my dependencies? We're working on integrations with some of the really popular tools that people use to solve these problems, like test containers and things like that. And for all the Kubernetes fans, we will be at KubeCon this year in Salt Lake City in November. And we've got a booth uh, yet again, and that'll be a chance to, to come and connect with us uh, for folks who are in the Atlanta area, we also run the Atlanta Kubernetes Meetup, and we've hosted it the last several months at our office in Midtown. So um, we're always trying to figure out ways to get out there and connect with, uh, you know, with, with folks in person and not just online. Yeah, that's great. And next time I'm in Atlanta, I'm definitely going to look you up because we got to do some barbecue. So <laughs> I, I was thinking about that. So I don't know if you know Fat Matt's barbecue. So you got to check out Fat Matt's. It's uh, just outside of downtown Atlanta. And I will definitely take you there next time you're in town. I haven't been there, but I'm, I'm now it's on my list now to do. It's a do bucket list item now. So <laughs> thanks for being on the show, Ken. We appreciate it. And, and welcome back anytime. I want to keep up with what the, uh, the latest is with speed scale. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Scott. One of the things I was surprised that came out of this interview was the fact that mocking and service virtualization is still a big issue or even bigger issue. I thought we had that problem fixed 10 years ago. Apparently not. And apparently more people need to understand how that works and why it's the best approach uh, to dealing with this type of development. Did you get anything out of this? I'd like to know. You can contact me in various social media platforms. If you'll scan that QR code, you can find out all the places where you can reach me. You can also reach me by email at heyscott at smcjournal.com, and I would love to hear from you about this. And I would encourage you to please like this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. It really helps the YouTube algorithm understand what my channel is about and that it's actually worth a watch. So thank you again for joining me and we'll see you on the next SMC Journal podcast. Scott Moore saying thanks. Bye-bye.